One of the oldest and most consistent challenges that face parents is how to get their kids to eat healthy food. How can we get our young children to eat their vegetables? This is such a basic question that it often seems something that must have been resolved already. It's important on at least two very different levels. First, young children are growing beings who expend a lot of energy. They need protein, vitamins, and minerals in order to support all of that. The rapidly developing brain of a young child needs protein, fatty acids, such as uh, DHA, iron, zinc, copper, iodine, selenium, vitamin A, vitamin B6, choline, and folate. Children also just need plain old calories, but that's not so hard, thankfully. In most modern societies, where we have plenty of calories, ironically, obesity causes more harm, harm than hunger. So in the short term, it's important to get kids to eat well. In many regards, however, this challenge is even more important in terms of the long-term effects, in terms of the eating habits that children establish early on, those eating habits that they'll take with them into later life. Those habits will affect their long-term development, their long-term health, their well-being in a whole range of important ways. In this lecture, I'm going to talk about several different studies but there's a theoretical thread that flows through all of them. It's this. Your body is smart, or can learn to be smart, about telling you what to eat. If you give it good things, then it will learn to crave them. If you find yourself craving peanut butter, there's a good chance that there's something in peanut butter that your body needs. Maybe you're low on potassium or iron. If you're craving Brussels sprouts, then your body might be low on vitamin C or vitamin K. If you've ever visited a far away, culturally very different country, you may have seen meal times where there's almost like an ongoing set of dares. You want me to eat what? With extra tentacles? Yet the very thing that you might see as somewhere between strange and even gross is something that many people, perhaps millions of people, think is not only edible, but actually quite healthy and delicious. How could it be that something that seems so strange to one human, how could it be that it seems so delectable to another? It comes back to this simple idea that your body learns to crave foods that contain the things that it needs. They say beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Well, delicious is certainly in the mouth of the taster. There's something there's some interesting research demonstrating that children's taste is already functioning within the womb before they're born, and that those taste and smell experiences they have are linked to their brains. We're able to form associations and memories about those tastes and smells even before we're born. A number of studies have shown that babies' flavor preferences can be influenced by the food that their mothers eat. If a mother eats some food, Within a short period of time, and for several hours afterwards, the chemicals that are a part of that food enter the mother's bloodstream and are passed to the fetus and the amniotic fluid where she lives. And infants ingest a lot of that fluid, especially during the latter stages of the pregnancy. All human infants are born with some common flavor and smell preferences, regardless of their mother's dietary choices. In particular, newborns love sweet tastes. If you put a few drops of sugar water on a baby's tongue, she'll lick her lips and generally look happy with the whole situation. If you put a few drops of a bitter solution on a newborn's tongue, she will clench her mouth closed, squint her eyes, and furrow her brows. It seems very obvious that the baby can not only taste the bitter flavor, but has a clear dislike for it. For a flavor like garlic, most babies are not big fans. They won't react as strongly as they do to a bitter flavor, but if you expose a baby to that garlic fa flavor, you will see facial expressions that correspond to dislike. In one study, a group of pregnant mothers were recruited as participants. About half of them were randomly selected to take capsules containing garlic each day. They couldn't taste the garlic as they swallowed these capsules, but it was there. It got into their bloodstream. The other women in the control group did not take these garlic capsules. A few months later, when the babies were born, Researchers assessed the infant's reaction to garlic flavor by putting drops of a garlic solution on their tongues. 
they found that the children who'd been exposed to the garlic in the womb were far less averse to that garlic flavor. Julie Manella, a researcher from Philadelphia, went even further. She ran a study in which one-third of the mother, mothers ate lots of carrots during their pregnancy. There was a second group of mothers who ate lots of carrots during the period of time when they were breastfeeding their babies. A third group was asked to avoid carrots during both of these times. A few months later, as the children were beginning to eat solid foods, Manella tested them with the baby food prepared with a small amount of carrot juice. She found that the children exposed to lots of carrots, either during pregnancy or during breastfeeding, consumed more of the carrot food before they stopped and began to refuse it. Kids learn about food flavors and eating preferences long before they start eating solid foods themselves, and even before they're born. If moms eat healthy food on a regular basis, then the kids will have healthy eating tendencies as well. So there's a good basic taste development system built into all humans. That said, many studies have characterized a shift that seems to take place in children somewhere around the age of two years. Many kids who as 18-month-olds, for instance, were voracious eaters, even brave explorers when it came to trying new foods, many of these same children rather abruptly become very picky eaters when they turn two. They may focus on just a few very familiar, especially, especially bland foods, and greatly resist anything else. So we'll discuss some reasons why that is, and I'll suggest some ways to deal with these finicky eaters. Specifically, I'll first describe research suggesting that you should pair new foods with familiar foods. Second, I'll encourage how to encourage children to eat new foods, but not be harsh or forceful in doing so. Third, you should eat the foods yourself in front of your children, Fourth, you should avoid filling the child up with familiar foods, especially sweet things, prior to exposure to the novel good foods that you'd like them to eat more of. Finally, I'll suggest that you should be patient and have faith in your child's own taste and nutrition-seeking systems. Be sure the child tastes at least a little bit of a wide variety of things, have an experience with those, and then his or her body will analyze the nutrients present in those foods and come back for more in the future. Okay, so let's start with uh, talking about why some kids might be finicky eaters. Why is often a hard question to address with experimental science, and that's somewhat true in this case. In many cases, an historical framework is best for exploring questions about why. In this case, let's think for a few moments about the history of the human species. As near as archaeologists can tell, there have been humans, homo sapiens, around for about 100,000 years, maybe a bit more. Very similar ancestors to humans were around for about a million years prior to them. During almost all of that time, until about 12,000 years ago, all of those creatures made their living in the same way, hunting and gathering. These ancestors of ours moved around to follow food sources. They would migrate as the season cha seasons changed or as herds of animals moved. They would also move if the food resources in some area had simply been used up. When there was no food, and this was not at all uncommon, they would go hungry. If that no food period lasted long enough, they might starve. If you lived in this type of environment, and our species, as I mentioned, has spent the vast majority of its time in just such a situation, there are a few things you might want to build into a body to enhance your chances of survival. First, you would crave anything that had a lot of calories in it. The taste buds that we have are really sensitive to sweet things. That's a, that sweetness is a, a test for something that's a really calorie-rich food. Our taste buds are calorie detectors. If an ancient human encountered something that tasted like modern candy, it would be reason for excitement and a whole lot of eating. Second, you'd want to store up energy in the form of fat whenever possible. Remember that no matter how much food there might be on any given day, a time of famine would never have been too far off. And the skinny, fit, model-looking humans would just not be as likely to make it through those famine times as would the heavy, happily chubby humans. Then, about 12,000 years ago, the most important invention in the history of humankind was produced. Not the iPhone, not the computer or telephone, not even the mousetrap. The most important invention was agriculture. 
Humans figured out how to domesticate their plants and animals, um, to grow them under controlled circumstances so that they could have reliable access to them. We figured out how to store large quantities of food so we could keep eating all year long. We figured out how to breed animals and keep them inside fences so we didn't have to go running after them all the time. In short, we became a relatively sedentary species with more and more calories available all the time. A hunter-gatherer had to figure out what was edible, often through experimentation. That's mostly gone from our everyday experience. But for most of the time that humans have been around, experimenting with new foods has been critical to finding enough nutrients to survive. Consider for a moment something that very few two-year-olds will have anything to do with, escargot. I often marvel at the fact that anyone ever decided to eat snails in the first place. Many snails eat plants that are toxic to humans. So to make them safe, you typically have to purge these toxins out of them by putting them in a wooden box without any food for five or six days. Then you wash them out, pack them in some salt, wait a little longer, then you wash them again, then you can saute them with garlic and butter and now you're all set. This isn't a cooking course, but it's worth noting that someone had to figure out that you need five days for the snails to become purged of enough of the toxins that they won't make you ill. Someone presumably must have tried one day and two days and three days and found that this wasn't long enough. This person must have been very hungry to have continued the experiment. But eventually, they happened upon the right formula. Now, if you're an adult and you eat a somewhat toxic snail, you'll have to deal with some really unpleasant symptoms afterwards. You might be very unhappy, but you're typically gonna live. If you're a small child, however, you have much less of a buffer to work with. A two-year-old who lived 40,000 years ago would have been starting to walk around and beginning their own food explorations. If they were as adventurous as the adults in trying new foods, they might not live very long or live very healthy lives. The two-year-olds who managed to survive and thrive well enough to have children of their own were likely the ones who were very cautious about trying new foods. In fact, the onset of this novelty avoidance in foods comes on at about the age when many ancient cultures are reported to have ended breastfeeding. Once the child was completely cut off from that food source, and better able to move around, this tendency for caution seems to kick in. Fast forward to today, the vast majority of children in modern, developed countries have access to an amazing array of different foods. Thanks to modern agriculture, they can get all of the nutrients they need, and they can do so with tremendous safety. But that caution that was bred into our species seems to persist. Their bodies might do a lot better if they could get some extra iron and B vitamins from some nice green leafy vegetables, maybe the delicious fish that you serve them, but many kids would rather play it safe and just do as well as they can with Cheerios, milk, and peanut butter and jelly. So how can you get a finicky eater, a child that for thousands of years has been bred to be a finicky eater, how can you get these children to eat more vegetables in a more varied range of food in general. I hope my story about the history of humanity already suggests one simple way to do it. Plain old exposure. Just make sure kids eat at least a little of everything that you eat. Not necessarily a lot of it, just some. That food will get into their systems where it will be broken down and analyzed by their digestive systems to the extent that those strange flavors are associated with materials that the body really needs, they'll be back for more. One of the best studies in this area was done by Catherine Forrestal and Julie Manella. They performed the study in Philadelphia, but Forrestal is now a colleague of mine at the College of William and Mary, which is exciting. They fed 45 infants the same type of baby food each day for eight days in a row. Half of these uh, five and a half month old children received green beans. The other half were fed green beans and then peaches for each day for eight days in a row. They recorded a variety of things about how, the infants, uh, about how these infants ate, but the two primary measures were, first, how much of the food the infants ate before they stopped accepting it, and two, what facial expressions did the infants make while they were eating. It's probably not very surprising that the babies liked the peaches better than the green beans. 
All infants, as I mentioned, are born with this natural craving for sweet things. The babies ate about 57 grams of the green beans and about 69 grams of the peaches. As the infants ate the green beans, the babies were, they were very likely to make facial expressions that we adults associate with distaste. They squinted their eyes, they moved their eyebrows and raised their upper lips. Many of them wrinkled their noses as they reacted with what sure looked like displeasure. Now, if you are a kind and caring parent, you might see this as your child is eating green beans and think that maybe this whole green bean idea was a bad one. Sure, there are a lot of great vitamins in here, but look at how the baby's reacting. These must taste really awful. Over the course of the eight days, however, a remarkable thing happened with both groups of kids. They started to eat more and more green beans. By the end of the study, the kids were eating an average of about 94 grams of green beans. That's really remarkable given that they increased their peach eating only up to about 78 grams. They learned to eat more green beans than peaches. This all fits very well with the story that we're developing here. Exposure to a nutritious food increases a child's future desire for it. It's worth noting that the children certainly don't seem to know that themselves. Those facial expressions seem to indicate a desire to do anything but eat those green beans. A clear tip that emerges from this study is that parents should, to a large extent, ignore those facial expressions and general negative reactions to new foods. As long as the child tries at least some of the nutritious food, the normal taste development system process will, will just take over. One of the first things that this forestal study looked at was whether presenting the green beans along with the peaches might make kids more accepting of them. There wasn't any clear evidence of this in their particular experiment, but several other studies have shown just that to be true. Elizabeth Capaldi at Arizona State University did a, a really clever study in which she presented about 50 kids between ages uh, two and five years of age um, with, uh, with a drink of grapefruit juice. Uh, for some of the children, the juice was sweetened with a little bit of sucrose. For others, the children were just given the unsweetened grapefruit juice. When kids were asked how much they liked the juice, the kids with the sweetened grapefruit juice, not at all surprisingly here, indicated they liked it much more. Kids are born with this strong preference for sweet flavors and this aversion to bitter flavors, and grapefruit juice can be very bitter. A few weeks later, however, the kids were brought back to the lab and given some more grapefruit juice. This time, none of it was sweetened. All of the kids got the same unsweetened, straight, somewhat bitter grapefruit juice. After drinking some, the kids were asked how much they liked it. The kids who had consumed the sweetened grapefruit juice two weeks earlier claimed that they liked the juice more, even though it wasn't sweetened anymore. The tip here is simple and straightforward. If you want your child to start eating some new food, don't present it alone. Serve it to your child along with some other things that she does like a lot. If possible, and if it makes culinary sense to do so, you might also try mixing those flavors together could use a blender to make a vegetable puree or just buy, pre, buy it pre-made in the baby food section. Mix vegetables into all sorts of recipes. Some recent cookbooks with names like Deceptively Delicious and The Sneaky Chef give lots of ideas for how to mix vegetables in with other foods. Again, our overarching theory fits just right here. Just get some of that healthy stuff in there and the child's natural flavor learning systems will come through. I've described using simple exposure to foods to encourage the children to develop healthy eating habits, but the studies I've described here make it sound perhaps a little too easy. You might be surprised how easy it is to get kids to eat good things just by serving them a little tiny bit of it on repeated occasions. But it might not work immediately, not within a few days, not like a few days like the Forrestal study at least. Patience is really key here. These taste learning systems work, but they often work very slowly over the course of weeks, sometimes months, not over the course of hours and days. There are two other tips to consider as you try to encourage your child to eat a more varied diet, including vegetables and other vitamin-rich foods. The first comes from cognitive neuroscience studies on the influence of hunger on the pleasures associated with flavor. Almost everyone has had the experience of being very hungry and then tremendously enjoying some meal. 
It seems that the food just tastes better when we're hungry. Even mediocre, typical kinds of food can seem downright delicious if you're hungry enough. If you're hungry enough, even a plain old ham and cheese sandwich can seem like the most delicious meal ever consumed on the planet Earth. Several brain imaging studies have demonstrated that this isn't just imagined. There are particular parts of your brain that respond to the tastes and smells of food. Most of them are tucked under the front tip of the brain in the orbitofrontal cortex. When we're exposed to food that has a strong and salient taste and smell, this is the area of the brain that's especially activated. Most studies of this are based on the increase of blood flow to these areas of the brain that occurs just a few seconds after the food is presented. That pattern of blood flow can be recorded by a functional magnetic resonance imaging device, typically referred to as an fMRI. So you have a good food, the area lights up a lot. Very bland food, the area still responds, but not so much. The flavor of the food mediates how active this region of the brain gets. When you taste something really delicious, that perception is driven by the activity in this area of the brain. There's something else that influences activity in the orbitofrontal cortex, however. Hunger. The circuits in the brain that sense when your body is low on fuel, in particular when it's started to convert energy stores like glycogen and fat into use usable fuel, those circuits are connected to this region of the cortex of the brain. Um, when you get hungry, this area of the brain is potentiated. When it's in this potentiated state, its typical responses to food are magnified. If the hunger is great, the increase can be really substantial. This is interesting stuff, I think, but the tip that comes from it for kids is quite straightforward. If you want to introduce a new food in the hope that your child will taste it, eat it, maybe even enjoy it, there's a simple thing to do. Make sure your child is hungry. Now, I'm not recommending that you starve your kids to get them to eat their vegetables, but it's a very good idea to make sure you avoid snacks, particularly sweet, calorie-rich snacks, anywhere near the times when you're going to introduce one of these novel foods. Those snacks will, very literally, make that novel food taste worse. One other thing to avoid is introducing any novel foods when a child is, in any way, feeling ill. Like most other animals, humans used to have to forage for food for a living. Given the relative scarcity of food, they often had to try new things to experiment with might or might not be edible. Keep in mind that there were no books they could refer to here as to what to eat and not eat. You could get, you could get advice from the tribe of people with whom you lived, but in some cases, someone just had to try the new food. Well, there's another brain system that's present in many animals, including humans, um, even when they're children, that keeps track of things that have been poisonous. This system was so central to our survival that it needed only a single exposure, or just one trial, to learn, that's, learn about something new. And this system seems to never, ever forget things. Experiments have shown that if you feed a rat some novel food, some novel flavor, something it's never tasted, and then you make the rat ill, the rat will avoid that food for the rest of its life. Now, this makes good sense. If a rat eats something that's poisonous, it might be lucky to survive it just once. If rats had to eat it three or four times to learn to avoid it, and maybe if they forgot and had to relearn it at some point later, then they would be pretty unlikely to survive long enough to have baby rats. This same rapid, very durable learning system is present in humans. Say you tasted something new for the very first time, say maybe escargot. Say you also happen to be coming down with the flu and you became ill over the course of the following day. At a conscious, rational level, you might be absolutely sure that your nausea was from the flu and not at all the fault of those snails. But if you were unlucky enough to have this experience, you would likely never enjoy escargot again for the rest of your life. The link between escargot and nausea would be somewhat indelibly made in your brain. So if you have an inkling that your child might be coming down with something, if you received a notice from your child's school that, that the kids in, in her class had been exposed to strep throat or some other virus or bacteria, if your child seems uh, maybe a little run down, not quite himself, if any of these things are true, this might not be the night to serve Brussels sprouts for the first time. Brussels sprouts are amazing, but they are bitter. It's not worth risking a lifetime of enjoyment just to hurry along the improvements in your child's eating. 
There's something you might notice that's totally absent, absent from these studies. Pressure from parents or experimenters for the children to clean your plate. These studies demonstrate the tremendous benefits that can come from just encouraging, maybe gently pressuring children to taste the food, to, assume, to consume just at least a small quantity of it. Pressuring kids to eat large quantities of things that they don't want to eat is actually associated with some negative outcomes. I've often heard stories from my friends about the time when they were required to stay at the table until they finished their broccoli or some other vegetable, maybe just to clean their plate. The most stubborn of my friends have described staying there for hours, in one case, all the way until bedtime. Kids remember these unpleasant experiences. There's even one study on adult food preferences that suggests it can lead to a long-term dislike of foods that are forced on children. There's also a lot of evidence that it doesn't work very well, even in the medium term. In one experiment conducted by Amy Galloway and her colleagues, preschoolers visited their lab on multiple occasions to eat some soup. They found that children who were pressured to finish their soup didn't actually eat much more than children who weren't. And children who were frequently pressured by their parents to eat more at home were significantly more resistant to pressure from the experimenters to finish that bowl. So you might force a child to finish their vegetables on some particular evening, but unless you're ready to do that every night for years, it won't lead to better food acceptance behaviors. Children adapt to the presence of pressure from their parents to, to accommodate for it, so as to actually eat what they really wanted to eat in the first place. Consider this from a child's perspective. Imagine that you know, whenever you stop eating and say you're finished, that you will be compelled by your parents to eat another five bites of vegetables. What would you do? A sensible strategy would be to say you're finished when you actually really want about five more bites. You're pressured to eat more and end up eating pretty much the amount you wanted to eat in the first place. Again, the tip is to provide good food for the child to sample, be sure that they taste everything, and then let nature and the children's brains do the rest. The next tip for parents who want their kids to eat more healthy foods is one of the best. Eat more healthy foods yourself. Children are very influenced by their most frequent adult role models, their parents. When a child sees you eat and enjoy healthy food, she will tend to mimic you and do the same. One study tested this very specific idea. Researchers visited the homes of about 1,600 parents and families with children between the ages of one and six years. For a randomly selected half of the families, education about good eating habits was provided, along with specific suggestions for how to increase their intake of fruits and vegetables. The parents responded to this by increasing their own consumption of fruits and vegetables. And so did the children. In fact, the best predictor of how much the children increased their intake of fruits and vegetables was just how much the parents increased their own. Something that wasn't predicted by the study, but emerged from analyses of the data, was also a significant reduction in the parents' use of coercive eating practices. That fits nicely with those other studies that suggest those practices aren't especially effective. In this lecture, I've discussed some things about children's eating and some tips for how to promote good lifelong eating habits. Almost all children seem to go through a period when they become very picky eaters. By slowly, Gently introducing new foods, however, almost all children get past that phase. Not all children will enjoy all things, however. It's worth noting that children's nutritional needs are quite different from those of adults. I have yet to meet a five-year-old who really enjoys Brussels sprouts. There's some great vitamins and other nutrients present in those sprouts, but most people just never seem to enjoy them until they reach adolescence or even adulthood. It might be that kids don't need the nutrients in those Brussels sprouts as much as we older folks do. Of course, not all cravings are healthy. Pregnant women may crave caffeine, for example, even though having a lot of caffeine is not good for a developing fetus. Chocolate, which contains only a small, safe amount of caffeine, might be a good substitute. But what we crave, whether as adults or children, is learnable. If you or your child eat potato chips with lunch every day for several years, Lunch may start to feel incomplete without that crunchy, greasy, salty bit included. If you eat carrots with lunch on a regular basis, 
your body will learn to crave that carrot flavor and texture, especially when your body is low on the particular nutrients that are found in a good carrot. Setting those carrot-like habits in place early means that children's eating will tend toward health throughout their lives.